Hey, I'm Jamie from Stillmeyer Games, and today I'm going to talk about 35 different components, innovative components in a variety of games that Stillmeyer ambassadors mentioned to me as components that they have found inspiring or interesting or innovative or just particularly creative or fun in the games that they're playing. I asked ambassadors this question in a recent survey, and I was really blown away with the response. that They, they mentioned some really great things, many of which uh, a lot of these games I have not played. And part of the reason is that some of these have not actually been released yet, but that's fair game. Uh, I'm posting this video in the hopes of inspiring myself and maybe inspiring you with some of these component ideas that you could put into your game to enhance the overall experience of playing a game on the tabletop. Um, so I'll go through these. I have ordered these uh, alphabetically. So I'll just go through these the, alphabetically. There's no particular order. Some of them I'll just read off what they say. Um, I'll try to comment on them if I have some thoughts. Uh, yeah, and I have BGG open, Board Game Geek open on my other screen in case I need to look any of these up while I'm talking about them. So the first one is Abomination. Uh, this ambassador says, Abomination has a clever pre-round event. Oh yes, a few of these are mechanisms, but most are components. Has a clever pre-round event that can encourage more competition over certain worker placement spots. It can also activate inactive areas. Also, taking the first player token doesn't take up a full turn. Instead, you take the very l last turn for the round. So some interesting mechanisms in the game Abomination. I've heard great things about this game and I need to, I need to give it a try. I have two, two people mention An Age Contrived. So this is a game that was uh, developed, maybe designed also, definitely produced by, um, by Chris Matthew, uh, a former project manager at Panda Game Manufacturing with whom I work. So they did some really cool component things with this game. And there are two mentions of it in this, in this uh, thread. The first is An Age Contrived has a neat upgrade mechanism for the player mats. Uh, so the, the upgrade mechanism, as I recall from the player mats in, in Age Contrived, is the way that you are sliding things into the player mats and upgrading them permanently. Also, someone said the customizable game components, uh, the monogram box, the choice of player board skins. And yeah, they did some really cool things. I talked about this actually on a Stonemaier Games blog about how uh, you have the option of choosing, uh, like, a, like they said here, a monogram box, a customized box where it says something specific to you and they are going to make sure that you get that box. So they're gonna print that box and then make sure that you actually end up with that box. I'm very curious to see how that works out. I'm certainly rooting for them to make it happen. Um, and uh, we'll see how it goes. Aquatica. This person says, I know this one is a few years old now, but that's okay. Old games are, are just as fun as new games. But I recently purchased this game after seeing a few reviews on YouTube. And I love the way the cards are used in the player boards by raised uh, by raising different cards to gain their bonuses to then allow you to purchase other cards or raise other cards to gain mantas. Yeah, so the, the idea at Aquatica is that you have these cards with little icons in the sidebar and you can slide the cards deeper and deeper under your player, player mat to cover up those icons as you overcome them or as you use those icons in some cases. So it's this neat uh, progression of an individual card and how far you, you've advanced on that card and what that card means when you've completed all the icons on that card. Um, I think that's a cool, cool mechanism. And the player mats work really, really well for sliding the cards under the mat and not just sliding them, but progressively sliding them under the mat. Uh, Castles of Burgundy, the acrylic components in the game. So acrylic is uh, along the lines of the um, the the player the tokens that we use in Libertalia, the loot tokens in Libertalia. They are called Bakelite, which is I believe is a form of acrylic, and they feel really good. I think the Bakelite is really nice if you're digging into a bag of tokens, like you do in Azul, to dig out uh, certain tokens. And Castles of Burgundy, uh, the new edition I believe uses a lot of those types of tokens in the game. They just feel really good to touch. Castles of Mad King Ludwig Collector's Edition. This is one of the few games on this list that I actually own. In this game, uh, they said uh, we found this compelling that the increased component size for Castles of Mad King Ludwig was compelling for them. So this isn't, isn't like an innovative thing, but they basically made the game bigger. They made most of the tiles bigger. They made the um, the space in which everything is kept on the table in Castles of Mad King Ludwig. They incorporated everything together in terms of like where you're pulling tiles from is incorporated into the same board that has the victory point track and some of the other things that you can pay attention to. So they, they consolidated everything into one big board. Dwellings of Eldervale, uh, the player trays in Dwellings of Elder Eldervale. We have a few mentions of player trays on this list, and this is one of them, how well the player trays work. You kind of pop into pop in the player board, and then you have all, all these different slots for, for where your, your tokens go um, in Dwellings of Eldervale. And Earth, Earth, I just played this the other day. In Earth, the person says, the interlocking wooden pieces in Earth and also Takenoko. And yeah, I really like this element of Earth. It's a, it's a subtle touch, 
Um, but in Earth, you have these growth tokens that kind of represent trees, but they could re represent a different, different types of growth, too. You could have bamboo growing, or you could have mushrooms growing. And the tokens that you place in Earth to, uh, to show that you are growing, there's two things that they did. One is they made the tokens uh, fit into one another. So if you do hit your, your player map, they're probably going to fall down. But they're, it's, it's harder to topple the tokens because they are interlocking a little bit. And yet they're still wooden tokens, more eco-friendly. Also, to show that you have completed a growth, because each card has a maximum growth at a certain point, uh, there's different tokens that you put on top. You put a little cap on the top of it to show you visually, hey, I don't, I don't have to think about the growth on this card anymore because I've completed it. I can focus on growing other cards that, that I haven't completed the growth yet. So I that was a nice way uh, to, to have a visual for players to see that they've completed the growth on their cards. Evolution and Arc Nova. Uh, the players, uh, this person says that they really like boards that are double-sided for vertical or horizontal gameplay options. Um, so in Arc Nova, there are two different examples here. One is in Arc Nova, the actual, the board itself is, can be oriented in two different directions. One has the cards pointed um, kind of vertically along this track if you have players on both sides of the board, or if you're just playing a two-player game and both players are facing the same way next to the board, then you can have the cards all facing those players. So it's a, the, the board is identical mechanically, but uh, it, it caters to different player counts or different seating orientations. The other example is Evolution. In Evolution, it's the player mat. It's not the board itself, but the player mat can be oriented either ver uh, horizontally or vertically, depending on your table space preference. Um, I think that's really clever as well. Someone give a shout out to Expeditions Metal Mechs. So the idea of having metal things in games where metal things make sense in real life. Uh, if we had mechs in real life, they would be probably made out of metal. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I'm glad they, they give a little shout out to one of our games here. Flutter and Hamlet. They use alternate alternative shapes for their tiles and multiple different tiles that still fit together. Yeah, so this is really cool in tile placement games. I think traditionally we've seen either square tiles, thanks to Carcassonne, and we've seen many hex tiles, thanks to uh, many space-based games. Um, we've even seen octagonal tiles in games like, I'm going to blank on it now, uh, Wasteland. There's a Wasteland game. What's the name of this game? I don't know if I have the right word here. Wasteland Express Delivery Service. I got it. Um, so that uses uh, octagonal tiles, giving you a little square between some of the tiles where you can put things. Uh, but also having other shapes. You can use other shapes. You can use, uh, I believe, um, one of these might use trapezoids, uh, at Flutter and Hamlet. They just use different shapes of tiles. And they can, once you start trying these different shapes, you can see how they fit together in different ways and can f form some pretty cool images as you, as you orient them around the table. So I like this reminder that for tile placement games, you don't have to always use square and hex tiles. Another a shout out to uh, Game Trays here, or Trays Designed for Games, that is the game Forsaken, which was designed and published, or is being published by the company Game Trays for the Forsaken campaign on Kickstarter. Oh, that's what the person's mentioning. But yeah, they, they have designed the game essentially around these trays. Um, so starting with a component and working from the, the ground up to build the game around these trays. I think that's a really cool concept. Again, this on Kickstarter uh, right now, as I'm recording this at least, and that is Fractured Sky. So it has magnetic pieces for bidding that have hidden combat strengths. Um, so basically, the, the idea is you have these uh, these miniatures that have a magnet on the bottom, and then the bidding tokens that you're using that indicate different combat strengths. You uh, put them onto the bottom of the miniature. So you select it in your card row, you stick on the magnet, which feels really good. If you ever use magnets in games, it feels good to have them snap onto a piece. And then you put your miniature out on the board. And so other players can see the magnet, but they can't see the piece that you bid on. And then you hold the magnet up and reveal to all the other players what you actually selected at the time that you bid. So I think this is just a really cool combination of mechan uh, me mechanisms and components here uh, in, uh, in Fractured Sky. In the game Frostpunk, the generator. So if you've seen pictures of the game Frostpunk, there's a giant miniature in the middle of the table. It's the tower, the iconic tower of the video game Frostpunk that was uh, ported over to the tabletop. Uh, this person says it reminds them of Return to Dark Tower. I think they're used in a little different ways, but it's essentially, I believe, a big cube tower, big token tower. But the presence on the table is pretty magnificent. Magnificent. Um, I think that the one downside to components like this is that it can block your view across the table, but... The table presence, I think, and utility is often worth it, uh, and you can always move your head and look around the look around the tile, look around the tower a little bit. Next up, we have Harrow County, a game that I don't know really anything about. 
Uh, this person speaks highly. I'll pull it up while I'm talking about it. They speak highly of the um, the dice tower that's built into the box itself. So let's see if I can find a photo of it. Oh yeah, here we go. Yes, yeah, so they built the cube tower into the box itself. That is so cool. So um, hopefully you can see an image here. Joe is doing the extra work here to put these images on the screen. But there are some holes in the box itself, in the box, and there's a tray that you put right outside the box to catch the things that you're dropping down into the box. That is really, really creative. I'm really impressed by that. So a couple of different uses of cube towers here in games. Uh, next up, Hickory Dickory. Yeah, when I saw this game, I was like, I need to play this because it's just a, such a cool mechanism or such a cool use of a component of a clock component where you're using worker placement and time as a mechanism on a clock. I love time as a mechanism. I love worker placement. So I definitely want to play this game. And I, I love the use of the, the clock's hands moving around the table to show you where your benefits are being gained. It reminds me a little bit of Sulkin, but in reverse. Um, here's another game I've never heard of, but I love that someone mentioned it. It's called Houston, We Have a Dolphin. This person says, although I don't usually look for games with apps, how this app is integrated into the game is super clever. It's a social deduction game that's playable in lower player counts and every card you play is scanned and tracked through the app. Brilliant. That's really brilliant. Yeah, I think this is one of the things about social deduction games. You often can't have fewer than like four or five players in these games because you're trying to deduce a certain amount of information. But if you have an app, that app can stimulate other players or can use the information, especially if you're scanning it in like this, uh, to use that information to make lower player counts work. So I love the games. Um, I love when games use apps or use apps to make the game more accessible to people. And in this case, it may, it's more, making it more accessible based on player count, which is great. So ISS Vanguard and Awaken Realms in general, this person loves the sun-dropped miniatures in this game. So this is a wash that you can apply to a miniature to give it a really beautiful look. Like it's, it's a really, really distinctive, beautiful look on the table. Uh, they may have uh, uh, copywritten copy written this exact use of, uh, of uh, the, the ink wash, but I think it, if you want to enhance your miniatures in the game, you can look at any other options than the standard ink wash that you see in many miniatures. You can choose not to ink wash it too. I think it's always an option to ink wash to not to ink wash. It does add a pretty significant cost to, to ink wash plastic miniatures. So um, it is something to consider, but it is a nice enhancement for a crowdfunding, a crowdfunding campaign if you have stretch goals. John Company 2nd Edition. Uh, this person says, I really like the resin elephant from John Company and how it looks and functions on the map. Yeah, I, so this is one thing I really like in games. When there's one specific token that, you, um, that you're often handling, I don't think resin can't really be used at scale for many different tokens. But if you have one specific token, and I've seen this also in, um, there's like a clay-like resin token in another game by the same designer, uh, PAX Premier 2nd Edition. Uh, use a similar token. So if you have a limited number of tokens that you're putting on the map, that you're declaring things, that you're using them. I think Ra at one point had one of these tokens. Uh, now they use a wooden token. I think resin can give it a really nice, heavy, distinctive feel to use uh, for that purpose. Cooperium. I have not heard of this game. I swear I looked at this list in advance, but I wanted to kind of go at it on the fly too. Cooperium. Interesting. Okay. Corporations race to control, to control a space station and mine Cooperium. I feel like I may have heard this game, heard of this game somewhere. Yeah, um, it says the card plays. This is more about a mechanism. Playing cards into your tableau creates worker placement spots that only your opponent can use. Yeah, as I was reading this, I was like, oh wait, Expeditions does this, but no, uh, Cooperium does it unique. Has this unique in that only your opponent can use the worker placement action spots that you that you create, and that is really clever. I'm kind of scrolling through the page here right now. That is a, a really neat mechanism, especially in a two-player game where the cards that you play maybe improve your tableau in a certain way, ongoing abilities, endgame powers, one-time benefits, but your opponent gains, it, those become action space, uh, worker placement action spaces for your opponent to use. That's pretty cool. Another shout out to player mats here, Lacrimosa. The player boards for Lacrimosa are really neat. They have slots to insert multi-purpose cards that you can only see the relevant portions of the cards for the applicable actions. Yeah, I've seen uh, player mats do this in really creative ways. And Lacrimosa is definitely one of them where you're sliding cards into the, the top of the mat, into the bottom, maybe the sides, but I think it's pretty much just top and bottom. And you're kind of inserting them into the player mats. I've seen so many player mats go with this dual layered, triple layered aspect. And um, it definitely adds a significant cost to the game. I think you have to make a choice. Is it worth it? Am I getting a lot of utility out of making this choice to make these dual or triple layered? Um, is, it, is it worth the added benefits? 
Uh, but for when you're sliding a bunch of different cards under the mat in different places, different orientations, I think it might be worth it. Um, we decided not to do it for our game Expeditions because I, you are insli inserting cards under the mat, but it's very easy to lift up the mat just a little bit and slide the card under there. And we ended up, though, because of the, some of the feedback we got, we ended up adding riser stickers to the bottom of it. So optionally, you can add these riser stickers to the bottom of the player mats, and they raise the player mat up just enough that you can slide the cards underneath the mat. So uh, one way to solve that problem. Someone mentioned the legacy of you insert, and this was actually the inspiration for this question in the first place. Um, Dusty from the mill mentioned that legacy of you uses a really clever insert technique, and I mentioned it on a Star Games post the other day, where the insert of legacy of you is clear and printed into the bottom of the box of legacy of you are um, instructions as to where everything goes in the insert. So the insert itself isn't labeled, but it's clear. So when you put the insert inside the box, you can see all the different uh, labels through the clear insert and you know where to put things. I think this is really, really clever. Lords of Hellas, linking the monument building in Lords of Hellas. Yeah, so Lords of Hellas, and there's another game like it as well, but they have you uh, building miniatures as you go on the table. So if you're building a monument, you start out with a base and then you put another component on it and then you put maybe one or two more until you have this grand majestic monument at the table that you're looking at. So I really like these, these multi-part miniatures. Um, multi-part monument slash miniatures that you're putting together as you physically assemble them. Merchants of the Dark Road. Any component like a wheel that attaches to the board with a magnet. We're back to magnets again. Maybe magnets are the new thing in tabletop games. But yeah, a lot of games that have wheels on the board use uh, little plastic uh, clasps to, to attach the wheel to the board itself. But if you want to go, if you have a little extra room in the budget, you can do magnets. And you actually need two magnets. You need to embed one into the board itself, which is creates complication, but it is possible. And it embed another one into the dial itself, whether it's plastic or if it's metal. And then you put them together. And, and they, they, it, it really is almost magical when you do it because you know you can always take off that dial and you can put it back. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's definitely not necessary at all. You can easily use clasps to do the same thing, uh, plastic clasps. But the magnet feels really good if you have that option. We explored this in um, the Scythe modular board. We actually explored putting magnets in all the tiles and putting the tiles, uh, having them snap onto the board, but it almost doubled the cost. Like it would have made the, the, uh, the modular board significantly more expensive if we had done that. The game My Shelfie, uh, the Calyx inspired Connect 4 drop sh uh, frame in My Shelfie has a real table presence. presence. Yeah, so it's like the game Connect 4, where you have this uh, vertical tower uh, with different slots where you're dropping things into it. But, uh, but it's representing kind of a game shelf and you're dropping different things into the game shelf to show where, 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 how you're organizing your game shelf. Another component that looks really cool, like you could probably do that on the tabletop itself, but it just looks cooler to have it um, uh, in front of you. And there might be an aspect in the game where what I put in impacts what you see on the, the other side and what you can put into the same um, interface. So we're interacting with the same interface and for that reason, it can help to have uh, the dual side. Each player is looking at a different side of the, the Connect 4 frame. Next up, another game that I'm not familiar with, Paco Sacco. Let's see if I can look this up. Paco Sacco. Here we go. The chess pieces that dance make you think about other ways opponent players, game pieces, and components could be joined or shared. Oh, interesting. Okay, the pieces in this game. So it's a chess-like game, but the pieces kind of meld together. Let's see what it says here about it. Um, okay, it's a form of chess created to be an expression of peace, friendship, and collaboration. The aim is to find, through strategic gameplay, a way to embrace the other player's king. So I guess instead of eliminating, eliminating or killing pieces in, the game, in this game, you are merging them together. And that might mean something in terms of what the pieces actually do. That is really creative and clever. I'm really impressed by that. I need to try to find that at a convention sometime. Paco Sacco. Reviving Kathmandu. I backed this on Kickstarter recently. This person says there's a deck of cards that is like a domino. There's two parts, one on each side, where you decide which side you are building with which offers that offers flexibility for players. This is a really neat thing to do. Yeah, instead of having a single card that represents a single building, you can have two sides of the same card, either front or back or on the same side, and you choose which side you're actually going to build. It uh, kind of doubles your uh, doubles what you can offer players while uh, offering fewer components. 
Sagrada Legacy. This person is just excited that they turned Sagrada into a legacy game. And this is another one that I backed on Kickstarter. I'm really excited about how they did it because they're using colored pencils. So we're going to use colored pencils to create the, uh, the stained glass windows in Sagrada Legacy. I think that's a clever way of uh, implementing the core game mechanisms, but also creating something permanent while you're doing so, which is a core element of that. I mean, that is the element of a legacy game. So this is one that I had to look up. I, I uh, this is a game Santorini Riddle of the Fink, uh, Riddle of the Sphinx, um, the story box in this game. So I had to look up what they meant by story box because I, I thought there was a a, uh, a story book in the game, and there is, but the story book is actually built into a container that also holds components. So it looks like almost like a three ring binder. Um, check out the Kickstarter page, or maybe it's on the screen right now. You can see what it looks like, but it 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 looks a little bit like a three ring binder that where everything folds together everything is just contained within one space except for some of the player pieces but there there are even little trays inside this story box i think that that's the right word for it we have the story book then you have these trays everything folds together it's just a really brilliant component that i i, I could never even picture happening in a tabletop game it's pretty amazing that they're, they're putting this together and i kind of want to play around with it myself it looks really really cool scholars of the south tigris yeah this is one that I have played recently as well. The dice action selection based on number and colors. This is more about a mechanism in Scholars of South Tigris than um, the components themselves. But yeah, it has a really cool dice action selection system based on, as I said, the, the number and the color that I gives you different options or defines um, how powerful the actions are. In the game Shake That City, and let me look this up because I'm curious about what they're saying. Shake That City. They say the component for shake that city that places the cube. Such a simple yet innovative idea. Let's see what it looks like. What is the component? Oh, I see. Okay, it's a little, looks like a cardboard box. There might be some plastic to it, but uh, you shake it up and that shows, uh, that determines what comes out of the box. Um, I've seen something a little bit like this in Camel Up, but this one does it where it it is revealing, you're kind of pushing this little cardboard slot in and it's, letting a certain number of cubes fall out in a very specific configuration on the table. That is really clever to have them come out so neatly like that. Um, I could see this being used, uh, probably tough to prototype this, but if this could, could work and that rubber band can hang in there for a long time, I could see this being used in other games as well. Very, very cool. Gives me some ideas. Um, the game Tang Garden with the standing landscape walls. Yeah, Tang Garden is all about perspective and uh, the vertical nature of the game. So Tang Garden has all these different components that you are building uh, on in your tableau. And also a lot of it is on the board itself. And they add elevation to the board. They add things that you can see or that you can't see um, that you're blocking. Uh, but the, the, the verticality of it is really amazing in, in Tang Garden. The game Terrascape. I don't know this game. Let's see. Terrorscape. They're talking about the integrated dice tower in this game. Let's see. The integrated dice. So this is a relatively new game. The in oh, wow. Okay, that's cool. So this has what looks like a giant haunted house almost. Hide and seek, hunt and escape, killer and prey. Spooky. Okay, wow. So there's a giant. It's almost like a pop-up in the middle of the table that divides the board in half. I need to look this up because this looks, I need to learn more about this game. Um, it has this, yeah, it's, it's this giant like haunted house in the middle of the table that you're dropping things into that's dividing you and the other players. This looks amazing. I don't know if the, the theme is up my alley necessarily, but I love the table presence and how it's dividing one side from another. Is it two players? Two to four. So I'm, I'm guessing it's uh, a team-based game. Very cool. Yeah, that's really impressive. I'll check that out. Looks like I may have missed the Kickstarter if it was on Kickstarter, but yeah, Terrorscape. Uh, Tiletum, this is a game that I haven't gotten to play yet, but it comes out almost every game night at one of my friend's longer game, game nights. Uh, they said that, how the dice serve dual functions in this game. The color and pips determine the type and amount of resources gained each turn, and the pips inverse from seven determines the number of actions one can achieve that turn. For, so for example, one resource yields six actions, while four resources yields three actions. That is really cool. I like that use of, uh, I love uh, number parity in games, especially when you're using dice. So the way that this game has number parity is really clever. Tiwanaku, this is a game that I really, really enjoyed recently. It's a, a deduction game. 
and they're talking about the disc that holds the scenarios in the game. You can check out my video on Tiwanaku to see what this thing looks like. They could have used an app, but instead they decided to use a like a six layer, car six different cardboard layers, all in one component, um, where you slide in the scenario, and then depending on what you're doing at any given time in the game, if you're looking at one side or the other, there are two two different things that you can actually reveal on this um, on this behemoth of, of cardboard can reveal the, certain information based on that specific scenario. It's just really impressive what they put together, how it can, it's modular, it holds these different scenarios, it removes the need for an app, and it gives you this big chunky thing to hand around the table that feels really good to handle as you're playing. And last, again, that I'm curious to play, Turing Machine. The seemingly endless puzzles generated by Turing Machine with a limited number of cards. I can't even begin to fathom how they pulled this off. So I think this is a game that's somewhat about AI. It's a, it's a puzzly game. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm curious to see uh, how the game offers that that amount of replayability with, uh, with only using a, a limited number of cards. So this is one that I'm hoping to check out at Geekway in the near future. So yeah, these are around 35 different components, give or take a few uh, mechanisms in there as well that, uh, that people have lauded and really enjoyed seeing on upcoming games and games that have already been released. I'd love to hear your thoughts. If there's a component of a game that you recently played and you were like, this is really, really clever, whether it's a tiny, the tiniest little detail component or a big dramatic detail uh, component like the one in Terrascape that I'm looking at here, um, let me know why you love it and what it is and what, where the, what the game came, what game it is in in the comments below. Thanks.